All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Grove, and I'm the director of the News Lab at Google. We're a new team focused on innovation in the media industry. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to this conversation with Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wudun about their new book. Let me show it to you here. A Path Appears, Transforming Lives and Creating Opportunity. Uh, before we start, we're going to play a short clip from the documentary by the same name that Nick and Cheryl produced in PBS and released earlier this year. Let's take a look. Our new project is called A Path Appears. The title is from Lu Shen, a prominent Chinese writer, who said that hope is like a path in the countryside. At first, there is no path, but as more and more people walk again and again, a path appears, meaning a solution appears. It's about innovative strategies for making a difference. In Half the Sky, we were asking, how do you begin to tackle seemingly insurmountable problems? Is that red door, is that a brothel, do we think? Yes, it is. She doesn't have a radial pulse. She stays safe, OK? In A Path Appears, we take it to a new level. We actually look at the roots of vulnerability, and we talk about solutions that really address those roots. It's easier to look at problems outside the country than it is to look at stuff in our own backyard. More than 300,000 girls go missing each year. In the United States? In the US, and 100,000 of them are sold for sex in some form. Nick and Cheryl use stories to capture attention. That's the signal. Police, you're under arrest, OK? Just That's oh. not the reality. This is the reality. Like every day. Because stories are powerful. That's her. That's her? That's Naomi. From Haiti to Chicago, from Colombia to Kenya to Boston, the central problem as we see it is poverty. This trailer is a home where they said they may have 14 people at a time. Yes. Poverty is much more than just not having enough money. It's not having hope. From sex trafficking to teen pregnancy to unemployment to substance abuse to violence against women. Cheryl and I are traveling to new parts of the world. It's overwhelming. I don't know if I've seen this much despair before. You're lucky if you're just struggling. The vast majority are just alive. At any given moment, it could turn ugly and violent. Cheryl and I are sharing real human stories of struggle, challenge, and transformation. I am tired, hear me? Are you tired? Yeah. Are you ready to go today? No. None of these problems exist in isolation. She had 14 kids, and those babies are going to grow up poor and they're going to remain in the cycle of poverty forever. We now understand how a tiny intervention can have a transformative impact on a child's life a generation later. Oh, wow. Yes. As we take our journey, we're going to be inviting along actors to try to highlight not just the problems, but the ways to chip away at them. I am Ashley. I'm a grateful, recovering, depressed, codependent, survivor of all forms of sexual abuse, including incest and rape. And about that, I have no shame. <laughs> Welcome to the circle. I feel like I've discovered this darkness that lives in our country. This isn't falling through the cracks. This is an earthquake. It's important to keep bearing witness, keep telling the story. <laughs> Powerful stuff. <clears throat> well, Nick and Cheryl certainly know, need no introduction to this crowd, I'm sure, but I'm going to make one anyway, because I think when you see a little bit more about where each of them come from, you'll see why they were perfectly suited to write this book. I'll start with you, Nick. Nick uh, grew up in a small sheep farm in rural Oregon uh, and went on to graduate Phi Beta Kappa from Harvard University, where he majored in government and wrote for the Harvard Crimson. Uh, I did some research. I saw that in the Harvard Crimson, he was named uh, one of the brightest students on campus. I assume you didn't write that particular article, but it was written about you. Um, after Harvard, he went on to Oxford and got a Rhodes, uh, on a Rhodes Scholarship and then spent some time after academia learning Arabic and Chinese. Uh, before going to the New York Times in 1984. 
He was a reporter. He started as a correspondent in LA, Hong Kong, Tokyo, uh, Beijing. Did I miss any? I think those were your four first gigs. And then in 88, I think in the crowning achievement of his life, he married, married Cheryl Wu Dunn. Yep. Uh, more on her later. Uh, and just two years later, two years into their marriage, they were the first ever husband-wife team to win a Pulitzer Prize. And they did that while reporting on the Tiananmen uh, democracy protests in China. Uh, as a reporter, Nick was known uh, for fearless reporting, for telling the kinds of stories that nobody else was telling, a habit that he only increased as he became a columnist in 2001 in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, he's been to over 150 countries, and I learned that he's one of only a few reporters, I think, globally, who's been to all countries in the axis of evil twice. <laughs> um, hopefully, every once in a while, you take a beach vacation. Uh, <laughs> but obviously, Nick's been to a lot of uh, amazing places. He's encountered warlords. He's caught malaria. He's come across uh, Indonesian mobs carrying heads on pikes. He's survived an African plane crash. Through it all, Nick's the kind of guy who brings his small town Oregonian sensibility to really deeply complicated issues um, and to much acclaim. Many of his colleagues call him the moral conscience of our, journalists, or of our generation of journalists. Um, he's got a lot of awards to back that up. Just a few of them are the Anne Frank Award, the Fred, Cune Fred Cuny Award for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. He threw another Pulitzer onto the pile in 2005 for his coverage of the genocide in Darfur. Um, and many of you might know this, Nick is a pioneer in social media, one of the earliest journalists to embrace Twitter, to embrace Facebook, uh, to embrace YouTube. That's actually how Nick and I met several years ago. So Nick, welcome. Delighted to be here. Round of applause for Nick. We'll move on to your better half, Cheryl, uh, who is a third generation uh, Chinese American who grew up in New York City. She began her career in banking, uh, working as an international loan officer after graduating from Cornell. Um, but she was soon drawn to journalism, and after working for the Wall Street Journal for a while, she ended up at the New York Times alongside Nick in Beijing uh, in 1989. And when she won the joint Pulitzer with Nick, she was not only the first uh, part of a husband-wife pair to win the Pulitzer, but she was the first ever Asian American to win the Pulitzer Prize as well. Um, she also later won the George Polk Award and the Overseas Press Club Award for her reporting in China. She then did something kind of rare in the news industry. She went from the editorial side of things to the business side of things and uh, tackled uh, some work in the strategic planning department of the New York Times, uh, working on circulation and running an effort to build the next generation of New York Times, New York Times readers. She stayed in business and ended up as a VP at Goldman Sachs. She's now a senior man or a man managing director rather at Mid-Market Securities, a boutique investment banking firm in New York that focuses on small and media companies and she's specifically focused on technology firms, new media companies, and double bottom line firms, which we'll talk about hopefully later. She's a sought after expert in the global economy, on the empowerment of women and girls, which is of course an overriding theme of our conference today. Uh, Cheryl, thank you for joining us. Yes, my pleasure. Steve, I've just got to say that the one uh, bit of intelligence you didn't mention is that Los Angeles is really important to us because that is where we met. Uh, oh, we started right? going out here in LA. I was working for the New York Times covering business. Cheryl was working for the Wall Street Journal covering business. And we had our romance in which we neither of us could talk about anything either of us was doing. <laughs> so <laughs> You signed non-disclosure agreements. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> Before every date. <laughs> that's great. Well, it's great to have you back in LA for the, the conference today. Sure, I want to start with you. Um, so you write in the book about the tension between solving business problems and, between so and solving social problems. And you write, uh, I'll just quote a, a quick part from the start of the book, quote, so many social problems in the 21st century seem intractable and insoluble. We explore Mars and embed telephones and wristwatches, but we can't keep families safe in the inner cities. We map subatomic particles, design robots that can drive cars, but we grudgingly accept failures in our schools. Violence and poverty, whether in the Congo or Chicago, remain towering realities. Why do you think it is that social challenges seem so much harder to solve than business ones? You know, that's a really good question, and uh, it's such a complicated issue that there's no simple answer. I think there are several factors at work here. One is that we see these social challenges as day-to-day -day challenges, so they don't seem very remarkable to us. It's like, oh, of course there's always poverty. Of course there's always people who are poorer than you. So it's not something that we think is a new challenge that is something that gets us excited to solve because it's been around forever. The other thing is that, you know, it is true that capitalism, um, you know, that profit motive really does move the needle. Um, I think people work for, um, it's not just money, but they work for pride in what they've accomplished when they have actually have created a huge amount of money, whether it's growth in a company or whether it's, it's just, you know, becoming rich. 
that's just an alluring um, factor, and that doesn't always exist in the social sphere. So when you're helping poor people, it's not as though there's a pot of gold at the end. Um, having said that, though, uh, you can solve, and I think that's one of the uh, issues that we raise in the book, you can try to solve social problems, social challenges, with the profit, um, you know, the market mechanism. And one of the most important um, examples of that, writ large at the macro level, is the way China was able to develop and lift 200 million people out of poverty, and they didn't do it through charity or through aid um, or, or in, a significant, in significant amounts. So what did they do? How, how did China um, succeed in this? They created incentives for people to work on their own, uh, to let people get rich. And it, again, it's that profit motive, that sort of motive of that the idea of the allure of you know, going from rags to riches that is what motivated you know, millions, hundreds of millions of Chinese. Uh, it was the market mechanism that, at work that really lifted people out of poverty. Interesting. You, know, you write about uh, the psychology of giving and, and the neurology of giving. So um, in your book, you speak about ways in which um, giving is actually more endorphin raising than other types of activities that you can undertake. Nick, you went to the University of Oregon, and you got inside this machine, essentially, that analyzed certain parts of your brain as you were presented with charitable opportunities. Tell us a little bit about that and what you learned. Sure. Well, I mean, there's always been this notion that it is more blessed to give than to receive, but it always feels a little bit hokey, you know, and uh, a little more kind of fitting into a sermon than into uh, uh, a textbook. And in fact, though, people have been looking at populations, and they've noticed, for example, that when you look at a population, that those who give more or those who engage in more pro-social activities um, tend to live longer, tend to have better health markers, uh, and tend to self-report higher happiness. Uh, one of the studies uh, uh, found the strong correlations with a lower mortality, that if you join a religious organization, uh, uh, mortality risk uh, drops 29%. Uh, if you exercise several times a week, uh, it drops 30%. If you volunteer uh, for multiple organizations, it drops 44%. Wow. And, and presumably, if you just you know, volunteer for a religious running organization. You know, you live forever. <laughs> <You're set. laughs> um, Why is that? But, well, the pathway there, we're kind of working out the pathways, um, but uh, it, uh, these activities seem to um, reduce inflammation. Uh, there are these pleasure centers in the brain. Uh, there are a number of them, um, uh, and they're, these are the places that respond to the most sensual, primal pleasures, to, to flirtation, to eating fine food, to sex. They're the ones that respond to drugs. When people get drugs, they're the ones that light up. And so at the University of Oregon, um, we were part of a study in which your, these pleasure centers are being examined. And uh, so your head is in this scanner. And you have a screen that you're looking at and a clicker. And you periodically get gifts to you. And when you get a gift, then your pleasure centers light up. But you're asked if you want to make a gift as well to an organization you admire. And particularly when you're watched and being monitored and you give, then it lights up. Uh, so there's some, clearly some ego issue here. But even when you're not being monitored and you make a donation to a cause you admire, your pleasure centers uh, light up. And it, it turns out there's a lot of variation among research subjects. Some people get more of a uh, of, a, of a happiness jolt mm. when they give than others do, uh, but that for about half of Americans in the study, they get as much pleasure from giving as they do from getting. There's a real gen genetic component, too, researchers are finding out, uh, you know, just as there is a genetic component to a lot of things, but uh, they are, uh, some of them are able to spot parts of the genetic code where they can see, okay, well, you know, people who have AA uh, alleles uh, on this genetic marker area um, are, um, you know, ones who aren't as compassionate. Uh, people who are GG, I guess you could get it good, good, but that's not what it stands for. GG, they are very compassionate people. So GGs would be Mother Teresa. Uh, AAs would be Machiavelli. Most of us are in between, uh, but. Partly, this is just the genetic uh, you know, condition that you're born with. Uh, you can also cultivate uh, your 
compassion in, in different directions. So you can cultivate the habit of compassion, of giving, of giving, and so you can actually move your, I guess you can raise your kids more in the direction of the GGs. Uh, it isn't always, you know, necessarily the best thing to be a totally GG, because you can imagine if uh, you would never be able to, you know, keep the salary that you, that you make because you would be constantly giving it away. So, you know, you want some, you know, somewhere to be somewhere along the spectrum. You obviously don't want to be a Machiavellian. So uh, it's very interesting the kind of research that they're doing right now because, um, you know, it's just at the early stages. But they are finding that there is a genetic component to uh, just how your body responds to cortisol, which is the stress hormone, uh, which, you know, um, you know uh, makes it very difficult for you to feel happiness. Uh, when, you know, it, when it hits the right things, then you've got... Um, a lot of the hormones that, you know, they're kind of like endorphins, not just endorphins, but there, there are certain hormones that are running through, coursing through your body that actually create that happiness effect. That is fascinating. So while there's some genetic predisposition to being more or less giving, it sounds like across the board, giving does increase your happiness yeah. neurologically. That's right. Um, I want to talk about the nonprofit sector for a little bit. Um, you did a lot of work looking at ways in which business practices were brought into the nonprofit sector in the past decade or so, and ways in which that's making a change. You profile in the book a woman named Esther Dufflo, who has brought impact measurement into the nonprofit space, looking at um, using randomized trials, for example, to determine whether cook stoves are an effective, uh, healthy cook stoves are an effective intervention in, in the third world, something the State Department has been behind. And in fact, she found out that they weren't as effective. Can you talk about the influence of people like Esther, she has, I think an economist at MIT, if I recall correctly, are having on the nonprofit space in terms of how it developed? Right, I mean, in many ways, it's a revolution right now going on in the world of charity. And um, by charity, I don't mean, you know, sort of, uh, you know, pitying people to give them charity. It's really the world that, of giving, the world of, of charity and nonprofits. I mean, they, they do a lot of good as well. Um, on the other hand, uh, however, uh, for the longest time, they were actually measuring often not the right things. So for the longest time, a lot of the old organizations have, you know, done a lot of good. They would actually measure sort of inputs. So they would measure how much money was raised, how many bags of rice were sent to a location, you know, to, you know, feed the starving people. They would measure how many bed nets were sent. But they wouldn't really measure the outcomes, which is what, in the business world, that's what we look at, results and outcomes. So they weren't measuring, well, you know, how many of the bags of rice were eaten by people who were starving, and therefore they became, mm. they were, you know, they got the nutrition they needed. Or, you know, how many of the bed nets were actually used to protect against malaria. Uh, and it's funny because they did find, as they were looking at, now there's more of this movement towards looking at outcomes, some of those bed nets were actually being used as fishing nets. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> so you can imagine if those bed nets were actually treated with chemicals uh, to prevent against malaria, well, if they're catching fish and then those fish are being ingested, it's not very good for the people who are eating the fish, or nor is it good for the environment. So uh, it's really important to focus on outcomes. And that's part of the revolution that's going on. So with Esther Duflo, what she has been doing is randomized controlled trials, as you mentioned. And she's taken on some of these um, areas where people think, oh, of course cook stoves work. Oh, of course micro lending works. Well, she looked at cook stoves, and she l looked at a, there was a Guatemalan, a project in Guatemala that had shown, oh, cook stoves really work. So she did a really aggressive, you know, thorough randomized controlled trial and discovered that, well, cook stoves don't really work. Um, they don't really help the health. I mean, they were supposed to really help people breed better because they were supposed to direct the, um, you know, the, the polluted air to go out, you know, through a chute rather than, you know, into the, into the home. And it didn't really operate that way because people weren't using the cook stoves the way they should be used. Mm -hmm. She also looked at microlending. So how many of you have heard of microlending, right? And you all think that it probably works, right? Well, um, Esther Duflo did a randomized controlled trial on microlending and discovered that it works, but only a little. Uh, in fact, uh, what works much better is micro savings. How many of you have heard of micro savings? Fewer. Well, micro savings is very powerful. And one of the reasons it works better is that, I mean, yeah. microsavings is basically, the way it operates is, what, the way it operates is very similar to the original concept of a bank. Every woman, you know, in the village who, you know, gets together to join this microsavings project, they bring a dime, they pool that money, and then every month they decide who's going to uh, get that money to borrow for a little bit. The what, reason, partly why it works, is that this, you are borrowing the money from your lifelong friends your only friends in the world. And so if you don't pay them back, you'll be a pariah, you'll be isolated. It really works with, with women. 
for some reason, it doesn't work as well with men. They just don't seem to care about not paying back their friends. So they can't figure <laughs> out why that is the case. But she has really done some uh, landmark work in this area. Interesting. Well, uh, you know, you write about other areas in the book where impact measurement is a little bit more difficult. You spend a lot of time on early childhood education. And groups like Head Start, or I think a group you mentioned called Reach Out and Read, they, they give books to, to children of welfare and others, trying to uh, overcome this 30 million word gap between kids of professionals and kids of, of welfare mothers uh, that is a hugely uh, challenging force in those kids' development. But these things are actually hard to measure because, in fact, uh, early childhood interventions sometimes pay off way later in life, yeah. right, through greater parental investment or stronger work ethic. So, are there areas of the nonprofit space where this kind of business practice of measurement just doesn't quite fit or needs to be adapted? Or, um, well, in the, I mean, uh, one of our basic arguments is indeed that one of the reasons why your interventions against poverty have not been for, more effective is that too often we start too late, and that it's often a lot more cost effective to work with a troubled, uh, you know, with a six month old or a six year old than it is with a 16 year old. If you don't invest in the front end, you end up paying for it in the back end. Mm -hmm. um, but it's true that. Uh, the early childhood interventions, uh, I mean, uh, especially education, you tend to have, uh, you know, you, you tend to see three things happen. First of all, uh, whether with Head Start or other uh, early education, so that child that is randomly assigned to an early childhood program uh, advances much more in that time. So it's better prepared for kindergarten, for example. Does better in cognitive tests, does better in school initially. Uh, so that's good. Then, unfortunately, by about third grade, that advantage fades. You have this cognitive fade out. And so there has been a tendency to think, oh, these problems don't work because these programs don't work because you, in the, in the follow ups uh, by about third grade, you don't see the cognitive gains. But in the longer term follow ups, again, all these same studies show that you have better, uh, if you will, life outcomes. So teenage girls who are randomly assigned to these programs are less likely to become pregnant. Uh, than those randomly assigned to the others. Uh, kids are more likely to graduate from high school. Uh, their uh, educational attainment is higher. They're less likely to be incarcerated. They earn more money. And um, that is, again, a common theme of almost all of these programs. And ultimately, that's really what matters most. Oklahoma is a state that has uh, made early childhood education a fundamental part of their education system. It seems to be working. Why don't more states do that? Um, don't jinx it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, I, I've been in favor of education reform. I'm a believer in the education reform movement. But I do think that the low-hanging fruit has largely been plucked, uh, that what we've shown is sort of a demonstration effect, and now it's going to be a harder slog. And I wish that some of that same passion that has been uh, expended in the K through 12 education reform movement can be redirected to the zero to five space, which precisely because I think there's just more potential to get things done, because there is more uh, bipartisan potential to, 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 to see real achievements uh, there. And mm -hmm. you know, you have uh, uh, liberal Democrats, uh, Bill de Blasio, who's moved forward on early childhood education, and then you get Oklahoma doing the same thing. I, in general, think also that liberals like myself should probably use the word inequality a little bit less and use the word opportunity more. I think it's, it's not a really a partisan issue, is it? Uh, one of the, my favorite survey found that 97% of Americans agree that there should be broader opportunity early in life. I mean, that 97%, I mean, it, nine, that's more, that's, you know, there's more Americans than believe that the world is round, you know, it, I mean, 97%. Right. If you can, and I, I do think that there is some hope for progress as a result in some of these early interventions. My fear, frankly, is that as Hillary Clinton moves, you know, if she m moves ahead and becomes the nominee for the Democratic Party, that we'll see what happened with climate change. That, um, uh, you know, if you look at the polling in the 1990s, then Republicans uh, and Democrats largely agreed that climate change was a problem. The moment Al Gore became the figurehead of, of efforts to curb carbon emissions, then Republican acceptance that climate change was a major problem dropped quite dramatically. Mm. And I fear that this will become a democratic issue in ways that would frankly undermine the chances to get early childhood education achieved for kids across the country. I mean, I think another one of the reasons is that, you know, kids don't vote. And, you know, it sounds silly because, of course, your parents do. But 
you know, it's, it hasn't become a real voting I issue. And so the kids, they can't speak up for themselves. And so it just gets lost in the fray. And then when it does become politicized, if it becomes, oh my goodness, it's done in Oklahoma. Well, you know, that's a red state. We can't, you know, here, you know, although New York City is doing it, we can't, you know, we can't implement something that, you know, a, a red state implemented. It becomes so politicized. So uh, it's very encouraging to see, you know, New York City, uh, you know, implementing uh, pre preschool as, uh, as well as, as Oklahoma, but um, it really should be adopted more, more widely. I think that there's just such an entrenched um, uh, interest in the K through 12 space that, you know, all of the effort is going in by the educators is going into K through 12, mm -hmm. and they don't want to, um, for any, they don't want anything to take away uh, their spotlight. A lot of the executives in our audience uh, would probably love to make a difference if they found just the right opportunity to do that. I, I really enjoyed the story in your book about Smile Train and Brian Mullaney, the executive on, from Madison Avenue, who took over this organization that fixes cleft palates. And within a very short period of time, using direct marketing, using a lot of his business acumen, uh, strong filmmaking and such, grew this organization into a multi-million dollar powerhouse in this space. Um, what business skills do you think the philanthropy sector is most in need of? Well, I think Brian Mullaney illustrates exactly what um, uh, so much of the um, charitable world is in need of. So Brian Mullaney, um, you know, he was a marketer. I mean, he's an advertising executive on Madison Avenue, um, just really outsized personality kind of guy. And then he started getting involved with a organization that helped fix cleft palates. And then he got drawn in more because he, he was criticizing how they weren't doing very well in advertising and marketing, and that was his thing. So it's like, oh, we've got to do this, this, that. So he started, you know, getting really involved. And I mean, there were, there were a lot of shift, shifts in what he ended up doing, but he ended up creating um, an organization that is basically a marketing arm. That's what he does. He markets, uh, you know, he loves what he's marketing, which is he's marketing good social causes. So he's marketing cleft uh, palate surgeries. He's marketing, you know, eye surgeries uh, for trachoma. He's marketing all sorts of, of, of you know, um, club foot, all sorts of, of really helpful things, but he doesn't do any of the implementation work. He is just the marketing arm. That's where his expertise is. And believe it or not, it's funny. So now we're in the day, with this social internet you know, age, we you know, use really cheap social media. He poo-poos that. He actually laughs when a lot of the NGOs say, oh, well, we'll use social media because it's free. He says, you don't just use something because it's free. You use it because it's a really good tool. And he actually relies on direct marketing. He has gotten it down to the science. He sometimes even knows on some of his campaigns whether an Allison will respond better than a Susan. I mean, he has it down. Um, and he's really achieved an enormous amount in terms of money raised. Um, just incredible. It's gone to, from zero to you know, 200 million in, in one, in, at one point in, in his uh, in his NGO career, and he's just done an incredible amount of good. But it doesn't always work. I mean, the other story, which is a counterpart to Brian Mullaney's where it has worked, and is a great illustration of how you can bring marketing skills into the NGO world. Um, another counterpart is Dan Pallotta. Mm. Dan Pallotta, I don't know how many have heard of Dan Pallotta. He was um, you know, a Harvard graduate. He had, at one time, wanted to be president, but then you know, that fell through, so he basically <laughs> Um, yes, we all, our, all of our plans to become president have fallen through, right? <laughs> um, but he then started raising uh, money for breast cancer and for HIV AIDS. And um, he uses, he, he basically put bikeathons on the map. And he started, you know, running these huge bikeathons that got thousands of people. And he would basically, make them mobile, they would go 200 miles on a bike, bike a thon and what he would do is basically create new cities every single night because people had to sleep. So he had to you know, create kitchens and he had to create dining halls, he had to create toilets and he had to you know, create tents for people to sleep in. And he would you know, put it up one night, take it down the next night and they would go when they you know, bike to another place, they'd, you know, they'd put it all up, up again. And so people would think, is that really a job? And it, it says, yes, he would raise basically millions and millions of dollars. Uh, but he also paid himself a lot, and that's where the controversy was. He paid himself you know, a lot, um, you know, several hundred thousand dollars, and so he got criticized for that. And so Avon, which was actually inviting him to run these um, bike-a-thons, um, in I think the peak year, what was the peak year? He, he, 
he'd raised some huge amount of money, like $80 million, which uh, in one year, which at one point was half of the budget of the Rockefeller Foundation. So it was a huge amount of money they was raising. And um, then Avon said, you know what, this is so controversial, you're being criticized for paying yourself so much and building a nice headquarters and spending all that money on that. How come the money isn't going directly you know, to you know, the, the cancer research? We think that you're just too controversial. So they took the mandate away from him. The next year, so Avon, the next year, um, uh, when they did it themselves, uh, they raised in that one year, so compared to 80 million that he raised the previous year, they raised a whopping $11 million. So if this were a company, if Dan Pilato were a company, um, he would be sort of a hot, a hot you know, venture, right? And if Avon you know, were actually, if it were its revenues that had gone you know, from 80 million one year to 11 million the, the next year, their share price would have been killed. But of course, nothing happened to Avon because this was their nonprofit mm -hmm. uh, uh, endeavor. So you, Dan Pilato was too early for his time but he really was focused on outcome, on results. And we need to actually you know, allow these NGOs to focus more on outcomes and results. And as donors, not always demand, oh, 100% of my money go to, to the programs. I don't want any of it to go to pay the salaries of some of the people who are implementing these programs. We need to change our approach you know, as donors as well. And it, it does feel like in today's uh nonprofit and cause sector that social entrepreneurship has made a more business approach to uh, too many charitable causes uh, more attractive. Uh, you look at Tom's or Warby Parker. Um, I saw a woman on a panel today who was really interesting who started a, a company called Skula, which uh, makes money from selling used clothing to school districts. Um, so there's a lot of for-profit, for-good, kind of double bottom line firms out there today. Are there areas in your research that you saw that that type of approach was better than a nonprofit approach? Uh, or, um, or more effective, generally speaking? I think it's hard to find a particular sector, but there is no doubt that this has hugely helped the, the doing good sector. I mean, we've traditionally had this sort of bizarre bifurcation in which we think that for-profit uh, companies, uh, you know, evil, greedy, nonprofits, noble, good, and obviously that's sort of absurd. What matters isn't your tax status, what matters is the impact that you have. And likewise, we've had this a kind of strange bifurcation where uh, we want to donate a certain amount of money. Uh, we want to give it all away. We never want to get any return whatsoever on that. And then you know, we want to, I don't know, <laughs> contribute to our uh, pension or, or uh, to our retirement fund. And there we want to just get the maximum possible financial return and have zero social impact. And again, that's sort of crazy. And I think that actually young people are kind of refreshing and they are much more interested in blending things and maybe for in their in their financial in their in their in their retirement account they will also want to have a social return and in their uh, philanthropic donations that they're willing to think of donating to a for-profit company if it's actually going to have impact and more power to them for that they're and absolutely there, right there's a lot of energy going into the social entrepreneurship space including social entrepreneurship for on a for-profit basis so um, one interesting um, uh, entrepreneur that, that we know, um, she was a Harvard Business School uh, graduate. She won sort of the social entrepreneurship you know, uh, award uh, at the business school. And her, what she's doing now, um, partly because she heard when she was in business school that women in the developing, girls in the developing world sometimes didn't go to school because they didn't have sanitary pads. And so she thought that's just absurd not to go to school because you, you know, once a month you have this problem. So she thought, well, let me try and make sanitary pads that would actually work in the developing world. And so what's important is that, you know, there isn't a lot of plastic all around, like, you know, but she looked for organic, uh, organically um, made um, sanitary pads. She actually had to create it herself because there were none. And so she, you know, took a bottle of Coke. They were all out um, in, I think it was Rwanda, and she had a team of chemists and a whole bunch of other uh, teammates, and they just got whatever kinds of things they could, and they started pouring Coke all over it. And they found, uh, they took the ones that absorbed the Coke the best, and the ones that did were banana tree fibers, literally the fibers from the tree of the banana tree. And so they, they are making sanitary pads from banana fibers. And now there's interest in the US. Of course, they're, you know, 
primarily going to make them in Rwanda to sell them in Rwanda, but there's interest in the U.S. for organic sanitary pads here for American women to use. So she's got a situation that really could turn out very powerfully uh, where you know, the profits that she makes here at home might be able to help subsidize uh, you know, her, her sales abroad. But she also is going to sell those pads even in Rwanda. She's not going to give them away free. This is going to be a for-profit venture. Sure, you invest in a lot of uh, social entrepreneurship uh, organizations. When you're looking at a startup with a social aim, a double bottom line firm, what are the kinds of things you look for that make you excited? Well, I say I advise, and I don't invest a lot, but I do, do advise uh, a lot. And I think that it's, you, first of all, you do look for the same criteria that you look for in a for-profit venture. And then you look at how the mission is incorporated into uh, the, uh, the double bottom line venture so that it's not just that I want to donate 1% of you know, my, my profits or my revenues to you know, a cause. I mean, it really, you know, some organizations do work like that. Um, Better World Books, for instance, does donate a part of their revenues, not profits, revenues to um, helping raise literacy rates or donating books. Um, but I think it works much more efficiently or effectively when you can actually incorporate that mission into the DNA of the uh, organization in the same way, for instance, that um, uh, you know, Elizabeth Shark, who's running the, sanitary, the organic sanitary mm -hmm. pads, it's incorporated into just the essence of the corporation, of the venture. It's probably a good segue for us to talk a little bit about corporate social responsibility. I'm sure many of the companies in this room have CSR efforts. Uh, when you look at the field of corporate social responsibility, Nick, what do you see that's working and what do you see that's not working? I must say um, I'm a little hesitant saying that in this audience, <laughs> um, but I find CSR in general quite disappointing. I think that CSR, for all the reasons we talked about, you know, the, has enormous potential and that when uh, you know, because when something is part of a business, it has a scale, it has an impact. You have the, these skill sets in the business world, in marketing, in technology, all kinds of areas that could have vast impact on social challenges we face. And in fact, I think CSR has typically been, frankly, largely window dressing. It's often it's sort of shunted off to this separate part of the company. If you know, if you're told by your boss that oh, you're moving off to CSR, then you know, you know, your career is probably yeah. <laughs> not on the fast track. And um, I think that is a you know really sad and disappointing to miss. It's a huge opportunity cost. Um, I think there are some exceptions. I think law firms are an interesting example where um, the really for recruitment, uh, you know, to impress potential new associates, uh, law firms do a pretty good job of pro bono work. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are another example where donations have really made a vast difference in global health. Uh, river blindness would not be um, on the way down if it weren't for, for donations. One common theme there is that both pharmaceutical donations and law firms are monitored, their CSR is monitored by outside groups, it's tracked. And I think that that is very, you know, is a sort of a lesson that if there were more outside, more rigorous evaluation of other CSR, that would help. And I guess, you know, I would just say for companies themselves, as you look at millennials and what's important to them, I think that the company they work for, the values of the company they work for, the image of that company uh, is a factor in their decision making. And I think that a company that really committed itself to uh, CSR in a more important way, um, that that would help recruit uh, top talent uh, and would set itself apart from others. And uh, so I think that that is probably the direction we're going in over the next 10 or 20 years. But I think so far, there has been something of a lag. Well, I think that um, some companies are actually spotting this. So there was one accounting firm, one of the major accounting firms, noticed that their retention of millennials was really lagging the retention at the, in the rest of the firm. And they were getting very nervous because, of course, the average age of the employees of this major accounting firm was getting higher and higher because the millennials were not just staying there. And so they were looking into why this was happening. And they discovered that millennials were basically thinking, well, if I'm going to be spending 16 hours of every day at the firm, I want to know that this firm is contributing to social good, that it's actually helping improve society. 
and that firm had not articulated very well for their employees what good it does for society. And of course, there are many ways that they can articulate, but they just weren't even trying to articulate that. So the company went through a thorough exam an examination to figure out how they actually could improve that to get that message and also to really allow millennials to um, you know, find value, social value in, in the firm. And so they created programs. They also allowed um, some you know, of the millennials to go and volunteer uh, in certain NGOs you know, for a period, a period of time that, you know, without taking a pay cut. So they did a number of things. Interesting. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the influence of the internet and social media on the space of giving and of uh, generating interest in a cause. Nick, you've been a, a pioneer as a journalist in social media. I remember uh, one of your first YouTube videos I saw was you in Ecuador uh, <laughs> having a papaya <laughs> shot off the top of your head by a man with a blowgun. Um, very risky. You should search, uh, I think, Blowgun Christoph on YouTube. You should find it. It's really entertaining. The, the video journalist who took that, uh, he was saying that if he, you know, if it didn't quite work out, he would be able to call New York and say, well, there's, you know, good news and there's bad news. Uh, the bad news is that Christoph just got shot in the head with a, with a blowgun. Good news is we got it on video. <laughs> it's a great piece. Uh, and it obviously called attention to your reporting in Ecuador. I wonder, though, if there is a way in which, while the internet has made causes closer to all of us and, and sort of uh, prevented the otherization of people who live uh, far away from us. It's also kind of desensitized us to it because there's so much media that we're, we're sort of face every day. Um, how can causes make sure they, they really leverage the internet effectively um, versus just sort of try to shout through the chaos of all the messages online? Um, I guess I'm actually a little less worried about the, this sort of numbing effect. There is a big debate uh, about slacktivism and whether yeah. You know, these sort of hashtag campaigns of bring back our girls or, you know, Coney, uh, uh, these kinds of things, whether they actually do any good. I'm something of a believer in them uh, on, you know, on balance that I don't think they're sufficient to uh, change the game. On the other hand, I do think that greater public attention that they bring may often be necessary uh, to, uh, as, as part of the solution. Um, and I think that one thing that humanitarian organizations have often been very, very weak at is storytelling, um, is marketing. Humanitarians flinch at the idea of marketing, you know, when it's so much more important to market bed nets than it is toothpaste or whatever. Uh, and so I think that the social media ethos is, is kind of spreading that. And if it can tell stories, that's, uh, you know, more power to them. What is one uh, nonprofit or cause out there today that you think is using the internet really, really well to spread their message and gain followers and attention? Charity Water is kind of a fascinating example of a, you know, an, a new uh, or reasonably new uh, upstart that has been very, very savvy with uh, social media, with their videos, uh, with making, you know, it's interesting. Obviously, church attendance has been declining. Um, what Charity Water does is kind of the kind of thing we traditionally would associate with religion. You know, it's getting people together in connecting to a cause larger than oneself, albeit doing it online, and making giving, not, not guilt-tripping people, as humanitarians often do, but rather pre presenting this as this joyous opportunity. Uh, and I, I wonder if it doesn't, for young people, if Charity Water doesn't push some of the same buttons that uh, you know, that, that church attendance might for a, a, an older generation. Um, and it's, you know, with groups like Charity Water, they're for the most part not digging wells themselves. So the wells are being dug by International Rescue Committee or others out there, but they're the ones who are galvanizing people and getting, you know, raising money and making it exciting to donate your birthday to, uh, to, to dig a well in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. and, you know, bravo to them. I think there's a lot we can learn from them. Very cool. Well, we want to turn to questions from the audience in just a moment, so please start to prepare your questions. We'll have mics in the aisles. Before we do that, I want to finish with a quick lightning round for each of you, given the theme of the conference uh, this week. Cheryl, we'll start with you. If you could complete this sentence, uh, just one sentence, uh, and then we'll do three of these in a row and see, see where we net out. So the first sentence is, one of the biggest challenges facing women and girls in the world today is? Uh, lack of education. Uh, at high, lack of high school for girls. Okay. 
And the most exciting solution that I've discovered to tackle that challenge is? Girls schools like the Cabrera School for Girls um, that really focus on how to just basically focus on teaching girls. The Bear School for Girls? Cabrera. Cabrera School Cabrera for School Girls. Cabrera School for Girls in Kenya. If we could just like oh, dot, oh, yeah. if we could just dot the entire developing world with a schools like Cabrera, that would be great. Okay, and the easiest way for people to support the Cabrera School for Girls is? Um, I think it's Cabrera, what is Sh it? Shafco.org. Shafco.org. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right, Nick, for you, one of the biggest challenges facing children under five in the world today is? Nutrition. That if you don't, uh, if you don't uh, give kids micronutrients early on, then they will never fully recover. The rest of their lives, they will be cognitively impaired. And the most exciting solution that I've discovered to tackle that challenge is? Um, iodizing salt or help optimizing breastfeeding, which would save 800,000 lives a year. Wow, 800,000. Okay, and the easiest way for people to support those causes would be? Um, Helen Keller. Is there Helen, Helen oh. Keller International does, uh, does, does uh, they encourage the breastfeeding. There's a group called Micronutrient, uh, something rather that does uh, I salt iodine. We have the list in the back of the book. Yeah, <laughs> buy the book at uh, the back of the room, and there's a list in the back of the book uh, on ways you can help. So let's turn to the audience. What questions do you have for Nick and Cheryl? Yeah. I think there's a microphone. Oh, sorry, here comes the mic. I was just curious, what um, consumer brands do you think understand that doing good is also good for business, other than like the obvious Toms and Warby Parker? Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of remarkable that some of the leading consumer brands that depend on the audience, on the public perceiving them as cool and wonderful. I mean, think of Apple, um, Facebook. Um, I think, frankly, hugely underperform in the CSR world. Um, and I'll now I'll probably get nasty emails from both of them. But other <laughs> organizations that actually are doing you know, quite good, I mean, Whole Foods is actually yeah. able to, 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 to use that um, a, as well. And um, so was Revolution Foods, which is a young venture. I mean, it's still you know, breaking what's like $60 million in revenues. But it's a Revolution Foods that basically delivers school lunches uh, to kids that are healthy, and as they, you know, they have no nitrates. Uh, you know, so when they use all those lunch meats, they have lunch meats without nitrates or, or, or nitrites. So, um, low salt, low sugar, that kind of thing. Other questions? Yes. Um, with Baltimore burning last night, maybe the night before, what path do you see that can help uh, the racial issues facing law enforcement? Um, I think that it's not just an issue of law enforcement, that those young people are not, you know, they're, what they're protesting is this general perception of no future, of hopelessness. And uh, frankly, if you're a, you know, if you're a teenage boy of color in a lot of inner city areas, then it's not entirely irrational to feel a certain amount of hopelessness. You look in some zip codes, and a boy of color is more likely to end up um, in prison than in college. And that is, if it's a child, that's not that child's fault. That is the country's fault. How do you turn that around is a complicated issue, obviously. I do think that early interventions uh, would hugely help. And the two, basically the two things that we've learned, the things that tend to work the most are intervene early, and work with parents or family members to support, to coach parents on talking more to the child, working more with the child in other ways. We're going to, to cre support that network. You know, when they, um, they actually have done research to look at how many words kids have heard by the age of four. So kids of, you know, um, parents on welfare versus kids of parents who are educated. And that gap, these kids have heard 30 million more words by the age of four than these kids. They've counted those words. So, I mean, it's unbelievable. It has to be spoken words by parents, not just watching TV. I mean, it's just that different. So you can imagine what happens when those two kids go to kindergarten. Who is going to be the kid that's more confident? It's going to be this kid. Other questions? got to be another burning question in the room. Don't be afraid. Over here. Yes. Yeah, shout out. You know, earlier on the 
Earlier on, Girl Rising talked about this huge initiative in India. I firmly believe what you said about education is fundamentally important. What would your thoughts be on effectively doing that in a country like India that's so complex? I'm sure you guys have been there. You know, the political turmoil, and I've tried. And I'd love your thoughts on how, if, how can we be effective versus, of course, the Bollywood stars are great, but you know, that doesn't get all the work done. So I'd love your perspective on that. Sure. You know, it's an interesting question, and I think we actually are learning more about it. And one of the problems has been that we focused on things like building schools, um, when the big problem in a lot of poor countries, including India, isn't so much building the school, it's, it's getting teachers to show up. And, you know, I've been to so many schools in so many countries where the students show up and the teachers don't. And that's because the teachers get paid from some central ministry whether or not the, the, the teachers show up. And uh, there have been pioneering efforts to try to correct that by having guys go around on motorcycles and uh, doing audits. And if the teacher isn't there when that motorcycle shows up, that teacher doesn't get paid that week. And boom, that really has an effect on teacher attendance. And you do the same thing with nurses at clinics. Nurses and doctors typically don't show up either. You do audits, they do show up. Um, teachers unions obviously are fiercely against this. Um, but boy, if you want to create more effectiveness, uh, that will help. Another uh, uh, really important intervention that is uh, you know, much more cost effective than building schools, deworming. Um, one Kenya study showed that if you want to get one marginal child into the school system in Kenya through bricks and mortar, it's $350 per marginal child brought in. If you do it through deworming kids, uh, it's three dollars and fifty cents per marginal child, and that's because if kids have intestinal parasites, the nutrition is going not to them; it's going to the worms. Uh, they're they're more anemic, uh, they're more sick, they miss school more, and you know, that is something that is solved with one pill of albendazole once a year, and has these dramatic effects. So, I do think that there, uh, and 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 in the case of India. Um, and Pakistan, we've seen that it can be done. Bihar, the state of Bihar, used to be this nightmare. Nothing could happen in Bihar. If you ever wanted to be pessimistic about anything, you'd go to Bihar and just, you know. Uh, and then it, they got a new chief minister, and bang, Bihar began to work. Um, in the Punjab in Pakistan, likewise, you had all these ghost schools that didn't exist. They were there on paper, and the money was going into the pockets of some corrupt official. Then um, the chief minister there, crack down on ghost schools. And so there, you know, a lot of it is not so much education, it's kind of management of the system more broadly. Yes. Maybe you could make a political comment in this context of the election, particularly with a woman, I'm pretty loud, <laughs> with, a, with a woman candidate, how does that, how can you see these values being promoted in this campaign season, and particularly with a woman either claiming that issue or backing up from that issue because of gender? Tradi Cheryl and I, for Half the Sky, we tried to look at the impact of women heads of government and women heads of state uh, on uh, countries, on uh, girls' school attendance, and on maternal mortality. And we were disappointed to find no impact. It didn't matter uh, around the world if you had a female head of state or female uh, uh, head of government. Uh, it did matter, though. It matters greatly. There are abundant evidence if you have a woman as head of your village or a woman at, kind of in the, in, the, in, the, in the country structure. And I think too often we kind of go for the symbolic gesture of who is at the top versus just having a critical mass of women all throughout the system. There's also some argument, which may be right, that often the first women to become leaders of a country are kind of the Mar Margaret Thatcher's, the ones, or the Golda Meir's, those who've, who have kind of fought their way through a man's world, uh, and maybe the second generation, or maybe, you know, or, I mean, Hillary Clinton has obviously been very focused on women's rights uh, throughout her career. I assume she would be, you know, different from Sheikh Hasina in Bangladesh, who has been disappointing, for example. Cheryl, any thoughts, final thoughts for us? Um, no, I mean, there are a couple. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah in the back. So I'm from Baltimore, and I've been watching my city burn. So I want to come back to this uh, question. Have you seen examples of market-based strategies that can help improve these inner city, this, this problem that we have in our inner cities? And 
uh, or alternatively, what do you think of things like the seed school model, where we have the inner city boarding schools to try to help break those poverty, of uh, those cycles of addiction and poverty? There's no silver bullet to any kind of social intervention, but there is, in a sense, silver buckshot. So there are a lot of little things that help to some degree. And so in you know, the case of, of Baltimore or any other inner city, uh, you've got to start early. Uh, you've got to work with, you've got to fix a broken school system. The neighborhood that, um, uh, that Gray is from, 45% of kids drop out in high school, as I recall. Uh, Gray himself was um, one of the 5% of American kids who's exposed to, to lead, who has lead poisoning. Um, those kids, they don't have much of a future. You need to create jobs. You need to deal with gangs. And there have been, you know, we, we write about Cure Violence, uh, an organization that has been quite effective uh, in dealing with gang violence. Um, you need to obviously work on, on police community relations. You need to work with local institutions like the black churches. Um, and I do, in isol you know, obviously these are all imperfect uh, piecemeal solutions, but in a sense that is how progress comes through this process of, of silver buckshot uh, that collectively can create hope and help begin to break these cycles of poverty uh, that leave people feeling they've got nothing to lose if they throw a brick through a window. Silver buckshot, that's a great way to end our conversation. Nick and Cheryl, thank you so much for being a part of today's conversation. Thank you. Uh, I want to encourage you to pick up this book. It is really fascinating. It is a complete page turner. There are wonderful writers. If you're looking for inspiration in your life, you will find it in this book. It's for sale right in the back in the bookstore in the corner. And Nick and Cheryl are going to be in the table in the back of the room signing copies of it right after this panel. So please pick up a copy and find them in the back. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you. Thank you. Hey, hey. great job. That was excellent.